Thank you for coming to the Feed Feed Test Kitchen at Food Loves Tech. I'm Julie from the Feed Feed and I'm joined by Winston Shu from Bum Bite. Uh, thanks so much for stopping by the Test Kitchen. Oh, thank you. Wow. Yeah, this is uh, the second year that we've been able to uh, host a demo together. Correct. So um, tell us a little bit about your background, your history as a chef, and um, what you're doing in New York these days. Oh, sounds good. Well, thank you guys for coming today and um, sitting through this. I'm actually making a sea bass uh, dish that's just inspired by my childhood as how I grew up eating it um, in England. And um, a little bit about me, I actually was a career changer. I was an actuary for 10 years before going to cooking. I've been cooking professionally for the last six years. Um, I currently am the partner of Bombay Catering, which is a local-based um, sustainable catering company in New York. I also am a partner at Little Tong Noodle Shop, which is two locations in Midtown East and Little uh, East Village. And currently run uh, Rethink Food, which is the charity partner for Food Loss Tech today. Um, and I'm the culinary director over there. It seems like every time I'm talking to you, Winston, you're either catering a wedding or two weddings in one day and have an event or speaking on a panel. So he's a busy guy. So I really appreciate you taking the time to come and show us um, this great awesome. thank recipe. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. I'm actually excited to come back. Um, so today, you know, I just want to kind of go through some of the products as some of these, um, most of these things are actually from the vendors here at Food Loves Tech. We have Mayor Glenn's uh, tomatoes, which I'll be using to make a tomato water. Uh, and for so our dish. is this a tomato water? Yes, yeah, so this is the, uh, just straight tomato water. Typically in the, in the restaurant, we'll clarify it. And by doing that, it's just basically, we will blend it in a, a Vitamix to separate the pectins and then clarify it. It takes about a two day process to just get clear tomato water. Um, this tomato, actually the canned tomatoes are really good. They're very umami. Um, typical other tomato, canned tomatoes, I'll have to like add kombu to it. But you know, typically we'll try to use it when the tomatoes are fresh and are in season. Um, here we have fish, um, bass from Barramundi, um, the Australis. So this, this stuff is uh, ocean, ocean farm, sustainable uh, from Vietnam. We actually have Julie here, who's, um, raise your hand, Julie. She's uh, representing Bar Barramundi. They have a booth downstairs, so if you go by, definitely try the fish. It's one of the most amazing sea basses I've, I've had. Um, and it comes packaged, de-skinned, filleted. It's beautiful, ready to use. Um, then we have greens from um, Gotham Greens, Arrow Farms are, that also have booths downstairs. Um, we got some basil from Gotham Greens, which I made uh, um, earlier. I made some basil oil. It does take about a day, so you know um, that's typically just blended with some with some oil, cooked to preserve some of the chlorophyll, and you get this nice bright green um, basil oil. Um, then we have a whole bunch of other micro garnishes from Arrow Farms donated today. Okay, great. So, um, um, what are we going to do next? Okay, uh, so first things first, um, we're, we're actually um, poaching this uh, fish, the sea bass and a little beurre blanc that I made. It's just butter, a little um, wine, rest, rice wine vinegar, um, infused with some aromatics. That's going to actually gonna be thickened up with a little cornstarch slurry, just to give it a, um, a little bit more body and it doesn't take out all the moisture. Um, typically, I like to season my fish. and. So what we'll take here is these nice pre-cut um, bass fillets. Um, we're gonna season them with salt. And I like to marinate my fish, or at least season my fish five to 10 minutes before I even cook it, to just really give it that flavor. Nothing more than that, uh, because it will, will cure it too much and it'll become hard. So you just wanna season for flavor and also it helps with the water retention inside the meat. And you said this is ocean farm raised. Do you know where in the ocean it's um, farm raised from? I know it's a product from Vietnam, correct? Um, so from um, Vietnam, and I think they just recently got certified green. Um, hopefully, I'm using that term correctly. Um, but Julie's there; she she knows a lot more than I do. Um, I've actually this is actually my second time using this product. Um, I used it about two weeks ago for the first time at a pre um, preview dinner that we had with all the vendors. So here, just you know, what they do like salt bay, you know, salt se season from season from the from the sky. You know, you don't want to overdo it, but if I was, no. in my restaurant, it's typically 1% of body weight. Um, other ways of um, actually doing it is actually brining it. You could brine it with um, salt water, 5% of weight. So like about four cups of salt to 22 quarts of water is the ratio. And you kind of, you, you submerge it in water for 10 minutes, 
and then you, um, you, you purge it with fresh water for another 10 minutes and you have a perfectly seasoned fish. Um, and also, it's just, it holds better, it's more flaky and it gives it more body versus, I mean, if the fish is fresh, it's gonna be good, but typically I like to brine it just to let it hold a little better. And it's easier to work with as well. So you said this is inspired by your childhood this yeah, dish? Yeah, I mean, a traditional Chinese dish um, would be steamed fish with um, so soy sauce, um, so you know, cilantro, scallions, but I grew up in England, so like we had what we didn't have all the ingredients, so my gr grandma would typically would um, stir fry in low tomato sauce and, and with fresh basil and herbs. Um, so it's a alternative. That's really interesting. Yeah. So what we're trying to do here is actually we're bringing up um, the butter for Blanc, it's an equal part of cornstarch to um, to water. Do you need a spoon for this, Winston? I got one. Okay, good. Yeah. And when it goes into the pan, do you need another spoon or anything? Yes, please. To stir it around? Okay, yeah. let me grab you one. Wooden spoon. So you're just making a slurry. It's one-to-one -one ratio. You want to make sure you season the, the beurre blanc yeah, a little bit as well. I mean, the fish is seasoned, but you don't want to, you want to make sure that everything else is well seasoned so that you're not taking flavor out. That Come works. Back. Thank you. So Julie, do you want to thicken this up for me? Yeah, sure. Um, as I stream it in. It's teamwork, right? Yeah. yeah. So you just want me to stir it? Yeah, you just want it. Oops. You want to stir it. You don't want to thicken it too much, but thicken to consistency where it's almost like a, a nice little... Velvety yep. would be probably the, the right. And you can test that actually on the back of the spoon as well. Yeah, the French call it nappe. Yep. You should so be able to run your, your finger through it and it should maintain its uh, consistency. So actually it's, it's coming in nicely. Yeah, so we kind of turn it down. And then in the meantime, while this fish is being seasoned, um, we'll strain some tomato water. Um, this process is actually fairly easy if you're doing it straight out from the can. Crushed tomatoes is good. If you have whole tomatoes, kind of just put some gloves on and, and just um, run your hands through it. I use a coffee filter. Smart. And you can do this a day, a day ahead or, you know, typically if you're, you want clear tomato water, it'll probably take two days. So it's actually a lengthy process. We're, doing, we're cheating a little bit here, so... Um, So, and it, actually the clear look, let's talk about that for a little bit. That's sure. really just like a visual. I, I mean, it's not going to change the flavor of the tomato water or the taste. It correct? would not. Um, yeah. Basically, as a visual, it's, um, you know, we clarify it by blending up. And what, what you're doing when you're blending up is actually taking the pectin from the skin and separating it. Um, so just a Nutribullet or a high-speed blender like Vitamix will work really well. But we're not here to be so fancy today. So we're going to have, you know, keep it real. We have um, Can you regular guys tomato see inside this bowl. Yeah, so this is actually pre-strained there. This is the amount, of, and don't throw away the paste. So whatever you're getting is actually good tomato paste, and you just, all you have to do is blend it up in a in a blender, and you have fresh tomato paste. Um, we try to be mindful when we're cooking, you know, um, especially when we're doing these dishes. So um, the tomato pulp will actually be used for like a ragu or something like that at at the restaurant. Yep. And actually, that's one great thing about Food Loves Tech. It's a zero waste conference. I don't know if you guys know that, but any food that's not being used or eaten today is actually being donated at the end of the conference. So we're packing up anything from demos um, and samples that we didn't use and we'll be donating it at the end of the day. Correct. So um, just again, the, the charity partner is Rethink Food. We actually have a booth that's um, being run down there. And currently what we do is um, we, put, we pick up from a lot of fine dining restaurants in New York City, such as 11 Madison Park, The Grill, Gramercy Tavern, uh, Nomad Hotel, uh, actual Arrow Farm, Square Roots, and Gotham Greens that are here today um, are participants. Um, we, we take all the excess uh, greens, vegetables, prepare food, and we actually create meals for the, the, those in need. Um, and it's very different because I don't think there's any other charity partner that does that, no. where they're actually creating meals from excess, um, excess food. Um, and actually, we partnered last year on a food waste dinner where everything was actually sent to Winston um, from Baldor. Yeah. And it was part of their food waste program. And he created a delicious dinner for about 70 people at Feed Feed. Um, and you would have never known. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, as, as chefs, we kind of want to be transparent and also educate people. How, how do we utilize the whole fruit, the whole, whole animal? And, you know, 
be creative in a way. You know, I, I typically look at it, you know, f food excesses. You know, I'm opening up my fridge and seeing what I can actually do. And mo typically it goes into a stir fry or so. Um, so usually you let this hang. Um, you, you can use cheesecloth and put it in a ball and you let it hang over the fridge and tie it up and it just slowly drips as you can see. Uh, so it is a lengthy process. Um, okay. While that's happening, we're going to cook the fish. Um, so what we do is just actually, Julie, we can just place the fish in. You don't, you don't, you want this at a light simmer, just so that you're not what they call hammering the fish or overcooking the fish. There's nothing worse than overcooked fish. Nope. Um, and again, for those of you who have just joined us, I'm Julie from the Feed Feed, and this is Winston Shu from Bomb Bite. Awesome. And we are poaching um, this beautiful white fish and a bird blanc. Awesome. And you can do this for chicken, you know, um, other types of fish, you know, fatty fishes. Um, bass is good. It's, I think it has good fat content and it has, you know, you know, it's one of my, actually my favorite fish to eat. It's easy to handle too. And so how long does this process take? Um, this process takes about three to four minutes if you're doing it on a super low. Just kind of, you want to cook it to the point where the carryover cooking is going to finish the fish off. Okay. Otherwise, you know. It should, it should be, um, what they say, almost, I eat my fish actually uh, medium, mm -hmm. and you know. I'm going to spoon a little bit of this yeah. over the top of these. Yeah. And you could do it with the top off, um, and just let it go slowly. Okay, so what else do we have over here, Winston? Oops, making a mess here. Um, so we have some Castel Franco. We're going to char these vegetables today. Um, so just kind of trimming. Castel Francos are just bitter greens. Um, they're like a basic family of endives. Um, just a fancier one. Um, they're very beautiful. They have these like cool patterns. Speckled so, patterns. Yeah, speckled patterns. So Julie, if you want, you can help me um, unravel them. Yeah, sure. And then we'll get, get basically cut them in half. Okay. Um, we just want the leaves. And sometimes I do this at home when I'm making like cabbage wraps. Mm -hmm. um, these are nice because they come right apart, but cabbage yeah. tends to stick together, so you can steam it for a couple of minutes yeah. before you have to unpeel yeah. it if you want to use it as a wrap. So this dish is actually, the leaves are actually really, they're bitter, they're bitter greens, and you know, for me, as I'm creating a dish, things that I like to kind of play around with is just texture, flavor profile, and that's Meg Savage, founder of Food Loves Tech. Um, sweetness, um, you know, all around the city, and what for me, what's a good dish is actually a well-balanced dish. Right, um, so here we have this really tasty bar blanc yeah. that's poaching the fish. We've got the sweetness, but also a little acidity from mm -hmm. the tomato water. Mm -hmm. The bitterness. The bitterness. From um, these greens. And it just, the, you, you got, you know, some fresh herbs to give it just that lift um, that you need. Are you guys excited to sample this dish when it's finished? <laughs> yeah. So am I. Awesome. So what else is new at Feed Feed these days? Um, these days at Feed Feed, um, you know, we're actually taking food tech pretty seriously. We're a food media company, if you guys don't know about Feed Feed. Um, we're the world's la largest crowdsourced publication, uh, cooking publication, that is. So we have recipes from contributors from all over the world. Um, and then we create a lot of our own content out of our headquarters here in Brooklyn. We're in Bushwick. Um, but we're doing a lot with Google Home. Um, so we're actually making our recipes available through um, Google's uh, application so that you can actually speak to your Google Home or your Google Assistant on your phone and say things like, I want a zucchini recipe or uh, what should I make with this marinara sauce, um, which I think is going to be the future of how people are cooking. You've probably seen some of the smart kitchens here featured at Food Loves Tech. Um, you know, we're all busy. We're always multitasking these days and you know I often use Google Assistant when I'm you know say coming home and unpacking my groceries um, but then I might say tell me some great brownie recipes you know because I'm doing one thing but actually it can speak to me and tell me a couple of di different brownie recipes the other day I said I want a brownie recipe that features tahini um, and it read me a nice recipe so I think they're there are nice, um, there are nice things that you can do with technology um, these days, and we're we're embracing that. Yeah, it's actually pretty cool. I mean, if you guys aren't familiar with Feed Feed, they actually, if you follow the Instagram, they're you're constantly just doing live videos, tutorials, and you always have guest chefs or people, entrepreneurs 
either yep. f featuring a kitchen appliance or new technology, pairing it with just different ways. Um, I, I find it useful. Thank you. Yeah, actually, this week at Feed Feed Brooklyn, we had Martina McBride. You guys probably know her as the country singer, but she actually um, just came out with her second cookbook, and she came in for a live demonstration, and she made a sweet potato and Brussels sprout dish with Giora from my team at Feed Feed. So we always have fun personalities coming in. We host a lot of dinners, workshops, and classes for members of our community. Okay, so, so you've added the tomato water to this pot over here. Yeah, we're, we're just bringing it up a little bit. Um, I don't want to, um, basically you don't want to cook off the acidity of the tomatoes. You just want to bring it lukewarm, so um, just so that it's not cooling down the dish. The fish actually has been there for, for about three to four minutes, and it's about 80% there. You kind of just let it sit in, in, in the water to poach and to keep warm, but also to carry over cooking is going to finish the fish beautifully. Okay. I'm gonna add a little bit of water to this. Um, so as I as, as I'm bringing this up, are there any questions? anybody anybody in a, just in the crowd? Anything that I can answer? Yes. Why did I decide to become a cook? I, actually, that's a good one. I actually grew up in a family of cooks and chefs. Um, I, you know, and you know, just working in the restaurant industry as a kid, it was just something that I really liked about com com um, basically communicating and actually working with the community of people. And you know, it's sort of I think you know, sitting at a dinner table has always been my fondest memories. Um, no matter your differences, no matter your, your culture, your background, there's something that's always in common and it was food, good food, you know, we also, bad food, it's, <laughs> it's also uh, something that brings people together, um, but more so it's, uh, it was just something I tinkered with about maybe going to culinary school or, you know, and I think there was just one day I had um, decided to apply f for a job at, at Armani and they had a restaurant there on Fifth Ave and I went in and the chef basically saw me, interviewed me, and said, you know, I don't think you'll ever make it as a chef because you're too comfortable working your corporate job. And I think that very same night I applied to culinary school and um, worked in a couple of fine dining restaurants um, after that. But for the most part, um, you know, I think cook cooking is just, for me, is, is a vessel that allows me to just connect with people and do these amazing things, whether it's the nonprofit, whether it's opening restaurants and changing the way we, we see food. Um, you know, I think it's a good, for me, for us at Little Tongue, it's a good, it's a good time for us because it's a good golden era for, I think, at least Asian cuisine. Yep. That's not in a sense elevated, but more so um, service oriented and also um, putting a modern take to what has been done traditionally so well. Thank you. And for the catering for us is, um, you know, I think, it's case by case, like working on projects that are, that are, that are fun um, and that makes sense to us. Um, so there's, you know, all aspects of it. Um, but my favorite part is actually teaching. Um, you know, so we have so many young cooks and I think, you know, this generation of cooks, um, they need a little bit more handholding than, than the past. And it's just being done done in a different way I think you know uh, for us it's just to see that to ensure that this this industry is going to be successful um, 10 years down the line and that we're not the last of it okay I, I think we're ready for plating so okay perfect yeah, just kind of clean some of this stuff up yep so tell me what to do Winston awesome we can take some of the fish out okay. um actually do we have a spoon? Yeah, I think maybe uh, one of these spoons right here. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So we have the fish here, and we're build, we'll build some samples. But Julie, we could s carefully take the fish out. Okay. Just plate the fish in there. We're gonna drizzle a little bit of tomato tomato, tomato. water in there. Okay. Um, garnish it with some basil oil and some fresh herbs. Okay, great. And did you want to char any of those? Um, yeah, I'm greens? gonna pour this out. Okay. And I'll, I could char it in the same pan. Okay, perfect. I think what's really nice these days um, in working and partnering with chefs is that you guys are often um, out of the kitchen quite a bit, you know, and, and have really gotten involved in, you know, food policy and, and, and also, um, you know, supporting local and sustainable companies that you believe in and it goes a long way for you know the patrons of your restaurant um, and also just general awareness of um, 
where your food comes from and um, you know and so it's been great for us to get to know chefs like Winston because he's really great at um, at sharing what he believes in and, and like he said he's involved in so many nonprofits um, that it's, it's really it's an, it's very inspiring thank you well I think it's just the responsibility and you know just you know in the age of Millennials we all we're always, always looking to do more and, and I think just you kind of have to will your way in this industry and kind of figure out how you want to contribute and what you want to do with it. Um, you know, so for chefs that are getting out there, that are you know being part of the community, I think you know it's a beautiful thing because it's you know we're it's basically changing the dynamic of what a modern day chef is. Besides just being in the kitchen, and, you know, being in the kitchen out, you know, for 40, 60 to eighty hours a week, it does dull, dull your creativity. So you know, you have to get out there. You have to eat. You have to share. And and I think this in this age day and age with media, it just makes it so much easier to do that. Um, Let's talk I, about some of the noodles that you have at your restaurants in the city. Kind of what the noodle dishes? What are your favorites? And, and sort of what are you guys known for? Uh, we're known for uh, Yunnan Mizan. Um, actually, Chef Simone Tong is not here today, but our booth is downstairs. We have a dessert on the menu made of of uh, palm palm sea jelly. Uh huh. Um, so my favorite, actually, my favorite dish was um, is the grandma chicken. Okay. Um, and any lamb dish that that goes on on a dish, Simone's done a really great job of just taking that menu to a new level. Um, so describe for us the grandma chicken. Well, so Simone is you know from from Singapore, but she you know she went to Yunnan about two years ago and was like you know I have I have these. I had this like noodle dish and it was amazing. And Simone, I met actually at WD Fifty while we we're cooking, and she was known to be the laksa queen. She would make laksa for a family meal, like these curry noodles, um, and it was the best thing ever. Um, so when she came back, she's like, "I want to cook Yunnan food and I want to make it modern." And I was like, "Well, that's great. I don't know anything about Yunnan. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn, and so by pretty sure we can make it tasty." Uh -huh. um, so she showed me this dish that was just like a soulful dish. It was like um, this black chicken that was just cooked in this um, confit in this broth with like noodles and and it had like this this just like it was like the color pops of just black and and just like flowers and because there's a lot of, there's a lot of flowers in Yunnan and they cook with a lot of flowers so I was like oh let's just make that and I didn't know what the dish um, should taste like but you know for somehow it was actually one of the best dishes that we ever made um, and it just comes with like richness of just like charcoal black garlic uh, chicken yeah. confit and it's just like it's one of those things like, no, you know, chicken noodle soup, you know. Awesome. Sounds delicious. So you awesome. want me to take the tomato water. How much yeah. do you want? Do you want so to we can take the tomato water me? and we could just drizzle around it. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. And then we'll finish with a little... Um, basil oil. Basil oil. So you said you grew up in London. Uh, when did you move to New York? Was that I, next on, well, your, on your city list or did you go somewhere else before New York? Well, I... I was born and raised in Brooklyn, okay. um, but my mom was from, you know, she lived in England for for about 20 years of her life, and uh -huh. I spent about six months there, six months back, so I had, a, you know, it was just, I had an interesting, you know, perspective on, on life, growing, you know, just being back and forth to two places. Um, but that's where I actually learned how to cook, was actually in the UK, uh, where my, my, uh, my aunts and uncles had uh, had you know small restaurants, mom and pop shops all throughout, and you know. When and you're so you said you go back every so often. Uh, yeah, I go back. I try to go back every year. Okay, and so how have you seen food change in London over the last say ten years? I mean, even the last two years has changed dramatically. I think just the number of um, restaurants that are opening up and booming in the Lon London area has been has been huge. Um, three of the restaurants that I actually went to visit last year um, prior to going to Barcelona, uh -huh. two of them actually got Michelin stars. So uh, I was lucky enough to actually visit them before they got so busy. Yeah, that's always nice, right? Yeah. Right before they get the Michelin star. Yeah. So the, co the, the, the culture there is definitely booming in terms of food. It's always been booming, but more so I think um, a lot of Asian cuisines are, are doing really well. And what are uh, your so, what are some of your favorite restaurants to eat at in New York? My favorite restaurants to eat at that's a good question. Um, Little Tongue Noodle Shop. <laughs> uh, no, honestly, I go where my friends cook. 
um, it's sort of the only time where you're actually seeing your friends and visiting your friends. Yep. And also, you know, they're going to cook a good meal for you. Um, actually, one of my favorite places to go is, is a wine bar in New York City. Um, Company Vincenetro. They It's actually on Center Street. And they're um, Caleb Gans, who was a good friend of mine, uh, alumni of like a lot of Madison Park. So like one of the best sommeliers in, in New York City in the States, to be, to, to be honest. And... He does a good job. They have over a thousand wines, and my friend Eric is also um, the chef there, and he creates such, you know, um, a dynamic, eclectic type type of food that that can't be found anywhere else. So for a wine bar, at least, there, you know, you're getting a full menu. Yep. Well, uh, chefs are lucky because you do yeah. have those relationships with other chefs, and then you obviously get special treatment when you yeah. go in and visit your friends at work. Oh, uh, that's one of the perks, right? Yeah. Um, but for me, I you know, Lilia is good. I like a good pasta. Um, but I, I tend to look, try to scout out all the small mom and pop shops. Yep. Yeah, you know, the lines aren't crazy. I try to avoid lines. That's <laughs> that's that's my general rule of thumb. If there's a line, I'm not coming in. Um. And you, so you do a lot of catering in terms of the menus that you create for these weddings. Mm -hmm. um, are they, um, you know, do you work with your clients to develop menus each time and, and learn what we they're do. interested it, in? It's, it's, you know, case by, case by case. I think the interesting about catering is sometimes it's just one and done. Yep. Um, and it's, um, but, you know, I think the process of it, getting to know the client, getting to know your customer, you know, where it's a wedding, it's, there's so many different elements of it that part of the hand-holding process and, and curation uh -huh. of that that's that one day is is fun to me and you know it keeps it interesting because we're not just working on one thing you know there's there's you know what you're working on this week may change next week um, well and also what is available right so in terms of uh, vegetables seasonality I'm sure your menus change as the year Evolves. Yeah, we, we definitely, um, we're sourcing um, locally, um, you know, the, the best in which we can. Obviously, like things like citrus, you know, we can't, we don't eliminate that. But, um, you know, working with Brooklyn Grange, Square Root Farms, Gotham Greens, you know, what they have available. But it's also promoting like-minded companies that are sustainable in, in their practice and are forward thinking about the future. Um, definitely is, is a highlight of ours at, at Bombite. Awesome. Awesome. Are these ready to yeah. serve? Yes. Awesome. So. Well, thanks so much for coming by the Feed Feed Test Kitchen today, Winston. Um, it's always great to uh, cook with you. I really appreciate it. Amazing. Thank you for Thank having you. me. Thank you. Thanks so Thank much for guys. watching.